as we think about uh, this final book, 55 verses in the entire prophecy, and I believe 45 of them are God speaking. Very interesting. Follow along as I read. Chapter 2, verse 17. You have wearied the Lord with your words. But you say, how have we wearied him? By saying, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Or by asking, where is the God of justice? Then chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. You will, of course, recognize that John the Baptist was the first one mentioned, the messenger who will come and prepare the way, and then the Messiah would come. Then chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. That's how the prophecy ends. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But we have read tonight what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. Let's ask the Lord to take us through this prophecy and to, to get as much out of it as we can and to appreciate that after this was concluded, God went silent for 400 years. What is promised in this prophecy, no one lived to see to whom it was spoken. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, you're the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we come to you in Jesus' name, bowing before you, wanting to learn. When we, when we read through Malachi, we say, well, we see that very same attitude today. And yet the difference is that we live 2,000 years on the other side of the empty tomb of the bloody cross. And if, and if you held the people of Malachi's day responsible, if you warned to them that you would come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction, then how much more should this generation be thought worthy of such a work by you in our midst? So help us to study tonight and to remember to pray the prayer of Habakkuk. Lord, we have seen, we've heard of your work, and we tremble and we pray, dear God, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make yourself known in wrath. Remember mercy. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. We're going to watch the uh, Bible Project video of the book of Malachi. The book of the prophet Malachi, he lived about a hundred years after the Israelites had returned from their Babylonian exile, and his message was directed to the people who had been living in Jerusalem for some time now. The temple had been rebuilt a while ago and things were not going well. Just remember the stories from Ezra and Nehemiah. Now when the Israelites first returned from exile, their hopes were high. They would return and rebuild their lives and the temple, all of the great promises of the prophets would come true. The Messiah would come and set up God's kingdom over a unified Israel and over the nations and bring justice and peace for all. But that's not what happened. The Israelites who repopulated the city proved to be just as unfaithful to God as their ancestors, resulting in poverty and injustice. And so in Malachi we find out just how corrupt this new generation has become. The book's designed as a series of disputes and most sections begin with God saying something, making a claim or an accusation, and then Israel will disagree or question God's statement. And then God will respond and offer the last word. This happens six times. 
In the first three disputes, God exposes Israel's corruption, and in the final three disputes, he confronts their corruption. And the overall impression you get from these arguments and disputes is that the exile fundamentally didn't change anything in the people. Israel's hearts are as hard as ever. The first dispute starts when God says that he still loves his covenant people despite their failures. And Israel rudely objects, saying, how have you shown us any love? And so God reminds them of how he graciously chose the family of Jacob, their ancestor, to become the carrier of God's covenant promises, instead of Esau, his brother, and the family that came from him, who eventually came to ruin. Remember the stories from Genesis and the book of Obadiah. And so right from this first dispute, Israel is exposed as suspicious doubting God's love and faithfulness. The second dispute exposes a problem with Israel's second temple. God accuses the people of despising and defiling the temple. And the people fire back, how have we despised you? And so God responds by focusing on the people, how they're bringing shamefully lame offerings of these sick, blemished animals that show that they don't value or honor their God. But it's not just the people, it's the priests too who run the temple. They not only tolerate but participate in these corrupt forms of worship. From top to bottom, God's people have proven faithless. In the third dispute, God accuses the Israelite men of treachery against him and their wives, which of course they deny. And God exposes the toxic combination of idolatry and divorce taking place. You have Israelite men marrying non-Israelite women and then adopting the worship of their wives' ancestral gods into their homes. Remember the story from Nehemiah chapter 13. And so Malachi connects this to a wave of men divorcing their wives for no good reason. And the people are all fine with this. And Malachi says, no, it's a betrayal of your covenant with God. And so Malachi transitions into the second set of disputes that confront Israel's rebellion. So the fourth dispute begins with the Israelites accusing God of neglect, saying, where is the God of justice? They see injustice and corruption abounding, and God seems to do nothing. So God responds by saying that he'll send a messenger who will prepare the people for God's personal return in the day of the Lord. He will come like fire to purify his people and to remove idolatry and sexual immorality and injustice so that only the faithful remnant is left to become his people. In the fifth dispute, God calls the people to turn back to him, to which the people say, how can we turn back? And so God confronts their selfishness. He shows how they've stopped offering a tithe of their income to the temple. Now, that word tithe just means one-tenth. It's the amount of their income and produce that the Israelites were to annually donate to support the temple and its priests. The practice is laid out in different parts of the Torah. Now, we know from Malachi and from the book of Nehemiah that the people were neglecting this response. And so the temple was falling into disrepair. And so God confronts them. He says he wants to bless them with abundance, but only if they're going to be faithful. In the final dispute, the people accuse God and say that it's pointless to serve him. They observe wicked, prideful people succeeding in life, and God does nothing. And God's response for the first time in the book is not a speech but rather a short story about the faithful remnant in Israel, people who fear the Lord and they love to get together and talk about how to honor God and serve him. And so God orders that a scroll of remembrance be written for these people so that they can read the scroll and remember God's character and promises. Malachi, he's reflecting here on the divine gift of the scriptures, how they point us to the past to remember what God has done in order to inspire faithfulness and hope for the future which leads to the conclusion of the book. It picks up and develops the imagery of the fourth dispute about the coming day of the Lord, but it develops it further. God says that he's appointed a day of purifying judgment that will consume the wicked from among his people. But what the conclusion adds is the future of the faithful remnant, because for them, the day of the Lord is not a threat. It's a cause for joy. It'll be like the rays of the rising sun that bring healing and life and hope for the future. And so Malachi's disputes come to a close, but there's still a bit more to this book. The final three verses, they're not part of the disputes, and actually they function like a concluding appendix, bringing closure not just to Malachi, but to the whole collection of the Torah and the prophets. So first, the reader is called to remember the law, or the Torah, of my servant Moses. This recalls the story and the laws of the covenant that you find in the first five books of the Bible. But then we hear this summary of the books of the prophets. I will send the prophet Elijah before the day of the Lord, who will restore the hearts of God's people. 
So this conclusion, it summarizes the Torah and the prophets as a unified story that points to the future. Israel was redeemed by God and then they betrayed him through their rebellion and hard hearts breaking the laws of the Torah. But the scriptures anticipate a future day when God's going to send a new prophet, a Moses, a new Elijah, who will restore God's people and heal their hard hearts. Remember all of the promises from Deuteronomy and Jeremiah and Ezekiel. And so this concluding appendix presents the scriptures as a divine gift to read and to ponder and to pray over. They tell the truth about the human condition, about our selfishness and our sin, but they also announce God's promise that one day he would send a messenger and then show up personally to confront evil, to restore his people and bring his healing justice. And it's that future hope that Malachi and the Torah and all of the prophets are about. Another good summary. When you get to this point in the Old Testament, and you see what's happening, what God's describing through the prophet Malachi. The people have learned little from their captivity. And they begin to lapse into the very same sins that triggered them being sent into exile. This is the tragic reality. Covetousness, idolatry, mixed marriages with pagan people, abusing the poor, and hardened hearts. And so God draws attention to this in these uh, interrogations that he comes to the people with. He pronounces a curse upon all who practice such things. And it will remain for John the Baptist to come on the scene. It's recorded in John chapter 1, verse 29. Behold the Lamb of God. Who, he will break the silence to offer tangible hope. So it's, you study this book with, with a, a sober reality, as I said earlier. The people have grown weary because they haven't seen the fulfillment of promises. They haven't seen the covenant blessing manifest itself. What they've seen is the wicked prospering. And they come to the conclusion that it doesn't do any good to worship God. Which, of course, when you think that way, you start thinking that way, that's the wrong. You don't approach God and worship Him for what you can get out of Him. You worship Him for who He is. And they've lost a sense of that. So let's Let's do what we've done now in, in the previous 38 books, take a, just a sort of a snapshot of a survey to break this down for you. Then we'll go into an extended survey of the sections of the book. And then we'll move into things like the authorship and the date and the purpose. When you try to date this, and we'll just say a little more about this in a little bit, uh, around 432 to 425 A.D. would be, pardon me, B.C. would be the date of Malachi. The, the location is in Jerusalem, capital. When you break the book down in a different kind of an outline, not the one that builds around the, uh, the, uh, the disputes, you have this privilege of the nation pointed out in uh, the opening verses of chapter 1. Uh, the reminder of God's past care for them and the expression of God's love for his people. You move from that section to, in fact, let's just, let's read that. Let's, let's Put these five verses before you. Look at chapter 1, verse 1. The oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I've loved you, says the Lord. But you say, how have you loved us? Is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. I've laid waste his hill country. And left his heritage to jackals of the desert. If Edom, and Edom is the descendants of Esau. If Edom says, we are shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins. The Lord of hosts says, they may build, but I will tear down. And they will be called the wicked country. And the people with whom the Lord is angry forever. Your own eyes shall see this. 
and you shall say, great is the Lord beyond the border of Israel. So this, this, this is the sort of the tone of the book. I've loved you. And people say, how have you loved us? How have you treated us any differently from other nations? It's, it's appalling and absurd to even hear it. And then he makes this statement about Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated. When I, anytime I come to that, you're, you're staring in the face and tearing down the notion that many, many people have uh, that, well, God loves everybody equally. This verse says that is not a possible reality. And I'm, my friend David Miller, i have told you about David Miller, one of my favorite preachers in all of the country. Uh, he battles muscular atrophy, so he's confined now to a wheelchair. But I heard him preach on this passage one time. And he goes through the, he, he read it, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. And we were at a conference uh, together and, uh, and he goes, he launches into this in only the way that, that David could. And he says, now he was from Arkansas, brethren, there are men here, capable men with degrees, much more learned in the scriptures than I am. And he just goes on and on and on about this. And he says, and they, they could help you understand better than I can the nuances of the words in the Hebrew for loved and hated. And he, and he, he comes finally, he says, he says, but whatever we may think about the word love, and the word hated, can we not agree that whatever they mean, they don't mean the same thing? You may have heard some people preach and talk about how, well, it means that God loves some and he loves others less. Uh, that's just still a dodge. There's a distinguishing love of God asserted, a distinguishing grace of God asserted here. And, and by the way, Paul picks this up in Romans 9, when he's going down discussing the dilemma he faced as a Pharisee to discover that, that he had missed the mission of God completely, even though he studied for it all of his life. And so Malachi opens up uh, this way. The, the second section is what we would call the, the, if the, if the first is the privilege that this nation, and, they've, and they're ignoring that, how have you loved us? The privileges could not be counted in the way that God has, has cared for his people, Israel. There's the pollution of the nation. They've, they've come back from captivity. Uh, they've grown weary. They had an early excitement. And remember, we went through that looking at the other prophets, rebuilding the temple and rebuilding the walls around Jerusalem. And, and but they began to get weary and, and determined it was of no use. And so God complains about the sins of the priests, the people who lead them, and the sins of the people. And then this third section, which picks up in chapter 3, verse 16, there's this promise to the nation, this promise of the future coming of God. He will come. Suddenly, the one who you seek will come to the temple. And you... You know, when you read that with New Testament lenses, knowing the gospel accounts of the life of Jesus, you, you cannot help but think about him arriving uh, in Jerusalem on, on the foal of a donkey, on what we call uh, uh, Palm Sunday, the Sunday before uh, the crucifixion, where he suddenly comes. And is recognized by the, the people as Messiah and, of course, is crucified by the Roman government at the insistence of the Jewish leaders. And so in this future coming, there's this book of remembrance. There's the, the coming of Christ, the coming of Elijah. John the Baptist is sort of a first manifestation. We, I just would remind you that it's, in the, it's on the Mount of Transfiguration where Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up to the Mount of Transfiguration toward the end of the Gospels. And there he communes, he dialogues with Moses and Elijah. And then, of course, in the book of the Revelation, which we studied years ago, uh, Elijah comes back to, uh, to usher in and show and signify that the end is near. That's how you break it down. That's how you outline Malachi. 
Well, for context, the great prophecies of Haggai and Zechariah are not yet fulfilled. And the people of Israel become disillusioned and they're doubtful. They question God's goodness. They question God's providence. And their faith gives way. And think about this. You know people like this. Maybe, maybe you've been there before. Their faith gives way to cynicism. They wonder whether it's even worth serving God at all. They go through worship and it's just going through the motions. Um, empty ritual. Bringing not their best to God, but what they have left over. They virtually treat with indifference the ceremonial law. The priests are corrupt. Their practices are wicked. And they themselves wonder aloud to the people, why is God not blessing? And so God comes with these questions. He's almost like an interrogator in the, in the book of Malachi to break these hard hearts up. But in each case, the people deny the accusations. I just want to give you a flavor for these. Our outline in the video showed six. I want to give you the questions. How has God loved us? They respond. Chapter 1, verses 2 to 5. How have we priests despised God's name? Chapter 1, verse 6 through chapter 2, verse 9. How have we people profaned the covenant? Chapter 2, verse 10 to verses 16. How have we wearied God? Chapter 2, 17 through chapter 3, verse 6. How have we robbed God? Chapter 3, verse 7 through verse 12. How have we spoken against God? Chapter 3, 13 through 15. One writer that I was reading said this. He said, he said, the people in effect were sneering at God's accusations and basically saying, oh, come on now. It's not that bad. One of the differences as you study Malachi versus some of the other prophets we've, we've read in the different times they were in is that this rebellion is sort of a quiet rebellion. And as they turn away from God and the hope that they have in God, they turn to materialism, to external expressions. In fact, what you see in Malachi when you read it with discernment is you see the pattern for what what becomes for us in the new testament the attitude of the pharisees and the scribes it's all external it's all external jesus calls them your whitewashed tombs you look okay on the outside but you are stinking carcasses on the inside you clean the outside of the cup but the inside of the cup is filthy this is this is the forerunner this is the the uh, early development of the scribes and Pharisees. But God says, in spite of this, he still loves his people. And he extends grace to any who will humbly turn to him. So when you think about the privilege of the nation, they're blind to God's love for them. They're focused on the problems of the present. They have forgotten God's works in the past. I've had occasion several times in the pre recent weeks, and I think I even spoke to it here from the pulpit, that, that it's, if we're not going to become cynical in dark times, and we live in dark times, we've got, to do, we've got to intentionally do some things. We've got to remember the past mercies of God. These people have forgotten that God's been merciful in the past. When you read through the Psalms, the Psalm, psalmist takes up a lot of time recounting what God has done for them. You need to do that too. You need to take inventory. Because the devil wants to hold our noses down to the present, particularly when the present is, is not necessarily altogether appealing. And it's important for us to walk back through in our minds, even write down an inventory how God has been merciful to us in the past. You've got to remember, remind yourself, 
of present promises. I think I've commended to you a little a book that's available. It's actually available in the public domain online. Uh, Faith's Checkbook on the Bank of Faith. Or, 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 that's not right. Faith's Checkbook on the Bank of Heaven. There's a couple of different ways it's stated. But what, it, what it is, finally, is devotional, daily devotionals by Spurgeon. 365 promises from the scriptures. You need to feed upon the promises. If you've forgotten God's past mercies, guess what? You're probably not being mindful of, of, the, of the continual promises in the scripture that are true for the people of God. And then, of course, you anticipate the future with, with the hope that God will show himself mighty and, and gracious. These people are not doing that. They're focused right now. That's all they can see. And they don't see God's blessing. They may see it other places, but they don't see it in their, in their lives, in their midst. And they're becoming cynical about that. When the nation then, when that becomes a preponderant attitude among priests and people, then there's a, there's a moral pollution. There's a spiritual decay that takes place. The priests have lost respect for God's name. You, surely you've noticed this. Just how easy it is in the culture for people to take God's name in vain. Not just using his name for a prefix to speak of damnation. But just to, in, in an exasperated exclamation of, oh my, and then they take up God's name. You hear it all the time. All the time. Brothers and sisters, that's, that's a violation of the third commandment. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. The Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. But there's another way to take God's name in vain. It's more subtle. And that is to go through the motions as if we are honoring God when our heart is not in it. This is one of the, the complaints God leveled at the people in Isaiah's day and, and others. These people worship me with their lips, but their hearts are not in it. Their hearts are far from me. And that's what you see in the, in the life and function of the religious leaders the priests. They accept worship that's unacceptable to God. They lead worship that's unacceptable to God. They demonstrate in Malachi here more respect for the Persian governor than they do for the living God. And God begins to make it plain he's withholding his blessings because there is a spirit of disobedience. Even if it may be subtle, it's there to his covenant and that they're not they're not teaching his truth with with fervor and zeal and a, and a heart committed to it as was mentioned on the video look at look at malachi 2 10, 10 to 16 uh, divorce becomes rampant chapter 2 have we not all one father has not one god created us why then are we faithless to one another, profaning the covenant of our fathers? Judah has been faithless. An abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord, where, which he loves, has married the daughter of a foreign god. May the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob any descendant of the man who does this, who brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. And this second thing you do, you cover the Lord's altars with tears, with weeping and groaning because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. But you say, why does he not? Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth, to whom you've been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Did he not make them one with a portion of the spirit of their union? And what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring, so guard yourselves in your spirit, and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord God of Israel, covers his garment with violence, says the Lord God of hosts. So guard yourselves in your spirit and do not be faithless. There's, it was just becoming rampant. Our generation is no different. And he will declare in Malachi, I hate divorce. As I live, I hate divorce. So the people have uh, 
There's a domino effect. When you, when you profane God's name, then, then it's easy to take the next step in profane relationships created by God. They question the justice of God on this. But he says the Messiah is coming. And it's interesting, there's a, Messiah coming is a fulfillment of promise, but it, God gives it here in Malachi in such a way it's a warning of judgment. They've robbed him, tithes and offerings. And all of these things he still says he's ready to bless them. Look at, look at chapter 3, verses 7 to 12. You're familiar with some of these verses, but, but hear them in the context of how they were given through Malachi to the people. Chapter 3, verse 7 to 12. From the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes. And have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions. You're cursed with a curse, for you're robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you. And pour down for you a blessing until there's no more need. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil. And your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. There's this, even though the people have conducted themselves that way. He says, I will bless you. Prove me. Challenge me. I will show you what a blessed God I am. And then they challenge the character of God. Look at chapter 3, verses 13 uh, to 15. Your words have been hard against me, says the Lord. But you say, how have we spoken against you? You've said it is vain to serve God. You know anybody like that? We probably all do, don't we? What use is that? It is vain to serve God. What is the profit of our keeping his charge or of walking as in mourning before the Lord of hosts? In other words, what good does it do us? And you see, well, the, the focus is wrong, folks, and yet, and yet I promise you this generation is overrun with that kind of thinking. God is worthy of praise, of our praise and devotion, simply because he is worthy of our praise and devotion. And there are too many people who are treating God like a, like a cosmic ATM machine. And there are too many people out there who are teaching that that's how he should be treated. And when we hear this kind of language, you wonder, what does God think of the pale of Christianity in the West today? Verse 15, and now we call the arrogant blessed. Evildoers not only prosper, but they put God to the test and they escape. That's what it looks like for them. And then there's this promise to the nation that, that, that become, becomes the conclusion to the book. He assures them a time is coming when the wicked will be judged and those who fear him will be blessed. There is a day of separation coming of the sheep and the goats. Judgment. Come you blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. You wicked, go into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. The day of the Lord will reveal that it is not vain to serve God. We've talked about this before when we went through the study of Zechariah and others of the, of the use of the day of the Lord. Just remember, when you talk about the Lord's day, and there is such a reality called the Lord's Day. It's the first day of the week. The Lord's Day is just another way of saying the day of the Lord. It is the day that we commemorate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's, it's the weekly, regular, cyclical gathering that reminds us that there is a final day of the Lord coming and we should be preparing for that. I don't believe for a moment 
that someone who intens- intentionally, habitually neglects gathering on the Lord's day with the people of God cares one whit about the day of the Lord. They're not thinking seriously about it. They're not thinking deeply about it. And they're probably in the category of people who think that in America, all you've got to do to go to heaven is die. But I promise you, if you read the scripture, there's a whole lot more involved in going to heaven and just dying. Jesus said, except your righteousness exceeds that of the, of the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not see the kingdom of God. We have to have a perfect righteousness imputed for us. And so there's this, uh, this warning and I want you to look at the, at the conclusion. We've read this before, but we'll see it again. Just read chapter 4, verses 1 to 6. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant, and we just talked about those in the previous verses, and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor nor branch. Think about that. No foundation, no way to extend life. Neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. You shall tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. Clearly a reference to the second coming, to the consummation of the age. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. They've forgotten the law of God. We mentioned this morning. And and there are people, they're, they're... I respect them at some level, who who would have you believe, and if you ever come under their spell, I pray you're delivered from it, have you believe that that the Ten Commandments have no place in the life of the believer today? It's a dangerous thing to teach. I don't want to, as a pastor, I don't want to stand before God and answer why I discouraged anybody from gazing into the commandments of Christ, the commandments of God, which are the same, by the way. No evidence in the Scripture they're different. The Old Testament closes with a reminder, remember the Torah, remember the law, which I gave at Horeb in the desert, at Mount Sinai. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. You think we have problems in families today? You think the home and the family is disintegrating, I promise you it is all around us. And yet one of the great signs, and I I think here when you look at this, this is one of those proleptic experiences I've taught you about through the years about prophecy. You see this in John the Baptist coming on the scene, introducing the Messiah who loves the children, but you see it in its great manifestation at the end of the age. When redemption touches every level of society, the chief level, the deepest level, the core level being families. If you, if you read anything on gang violence, on mass shootings, what is the one denominator, one common denominator that comes up over and over again about these shooters, these criminals? You remember what it is? Absent father. No father. He will turn the hearts of fathers to their children. And then he will turn the hearts of children to their fathers. Lest I come. What does he say he will do to a generation that's missing that? Lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Brothers and sisters, make no mistake about it. We know God, we've read the end of the book, God wins. But I'm telling you, this generation we live in, is under the judgment of God and deserves the blast of his fury for what has happened to the home. The gospel does better than that. And so this, this is a, a sort of a, a, a summary of 
the book. Let's, let's think about uh, the name Malachi. Malachi means my messenger or messenger of Yahweh, depending on how you, what form you see of it. And so we should not be surprised when we have this promise of the coming of the messenger. God raises up Malachi. We don't know anything about him other than that his name's Malachi, and it's mentioned in chapter 1, verse 1 of this, of this prophecy. But the name means my messenger or messenger of Yahweh. But it's interesting. This is one of those books, and you've been with us long enough now through this, you know that there's been some, some disputed challenges as to who the author might be, when it might be written. This book, though we have very little internal and external evidence, uh, the authorship, date, and unity of Malachi have never been seriously challenged in, in meaningful scholarship. You'll always have, have some liberal whack job that'll, that'll challenge everything. But I'm talking about in, in, in serious conservative scholarships, never been challenged. We don't know Malachi's father's name. There is a Jewish tradition. You may remember when we looked at Zechariah that he was a tradition that he was a member of the great synagogue. And that's a tradition also about Malachi. It's just tradition. We don't know. When you try to uh, pin a date on Malachi, let me take you over to uh, chapter 1, verse 8. Chapter 8, you hear this, when, when you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? When you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. The word governor there is key. Will he accept you or show you favor, says the Lord of hosts? How, how would you get by trying to do that with the governor? This, the word governor here is a Persian term for, it's pika. It shows up in Nehemiah, in Haggai, and it helps us date the book. The Persians had governors uh, during a period during a period of 539 BC to 333 BC. We know that sacrifices were being offered in the temple which had been rebuilt, remember, in 516 BC. So now we're this reference to to lame sacrifices being offered to to a pika to a Persian governor. See how he would like that. Many years have passed uh, since these offerings were reinstituted. The priests, we know that the priests have grown tired of them. They've, they've grown tired of going through the motion of, of slaughtering the animals and all. They don't see any benefit from it, any fruit coming from it. We know that Malachi's prophecy, when you read it and you read and you compare it to Nehemiah, is inspired by the same problems that Nehemiah faced. That's why if we're going through this and you're thinking, this sounds familiar. Yeah, we've seen it several times in the reading through the Old Testament. Intermarriage, half-hearted worship. We know that from study, our studies that Nehemiah came to Jerusalem in 444 B.C. to rebuild the city walls. 13, after, 13 years after Ezra returned, with his reforms in 457 B.C. We also know that Nehemiah returned to Persia in 432 B.C., but came back to Palestine about 425 B.C. And he dealt with these very same sins that are described <clears throat> in Malachi. And so when you're, when you're looking at the dating of this, scholars believe that Malachi preached his message while Nehemiah was absent between 432 and 425 B.C. That's the best time to date it. And that places it, by the way, about 100 years after Haggai and Zechariah began to prophesy in 520 B.C. So just to kind of give you a context here. Well, what is the, the theme and the purpose? Well, of course, we've We've suggested it's an appeal to return to the Lord or an appeal to backsliders, if you please. Malachi preaches, speaks for God. 
in an attempt to break through this, I, I told you earlier, the hard heart. These questions by God are designed to, to break through the stony heart. But this barrier of, of Israel's disbelief, uh, disappointment, and discouragement. Their promised hope, but it hadn't come. Conclusion was it really wasn't worth serving the Lord. You may know some people today like that. We need to come alongside them and say, don't, don't give up hope. Every word of the Lord is true. His promises are yes and amen. They will come to pass. We need to have a bigger set of lenses to look around the whole world rather than just look down our little tube, what I call our, our, our paper towel tube, to see, well, if it's not happening here, then it's not happening. We need to have a long look. And in the face of continual corruption, God shows covenant love. And the teaching of Malachi is designed to show the, show the religious leaders and the people that the lack of blessing is not because of God's lack of concern, but by their own compromise. They're disobedient to covenant law. And so... Uh, this, this purpose of calling the people back to God seems to be the theme. And then we'll just touch real quickly on the keys to, to Malachi. The key phrase that can be stated many ways. One is an appeal to backsliders. These folks, these folks have left their first love. They don't have the fervent passion. Uh, Jesus says the same in the Revelation for the church at Ephesus. It's the same kind of dilemma. The verses, key verses we read, I'll read them to you again, hopefully with a little more of a context now. Chapter 2, verse 17, you have wearied the Lord with your words. But you say, how have we wearied him? By saying everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord. And he delights in them. What are they saying there? They're saying the, the evil prospers, so God must, it must be okay with God. That mocks God's justice. Or by asking, where is the God of justice? His response is, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek, that's clearly John the Baptist, he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord. And then chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, to the, to the end, I send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children, the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land. This, this is interesting. There's a positive and a hopeful tone, but do you notice when you read it all the way out that the book of Malachi ends on a warning of judgment? Lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. The critical chapter, the key chapter, is chapter 3. promise of sending the messenger you'll recognize Matthew 3 3 the voice of one crying in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord well where do we see Jesus in Malachi well the promise of the coming of the messenger the one who will prepare the way look at John 1 29 when you see this fulfilled the next day he saw Jesus coming toward him. This is John the Baptist. He said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is anticipated in Malachi. Malachi 3.1. We're going to keep reading. We've read it several times now, but it's critical. Behold, I send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. There's, that's what John the Baptist was doing when he came on the scene. Isaiah 40 verse 3 further expresses this. A voice cries, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And that's what John the Baptist said he was, a voice crying in the wilderness. And then Malachi 3, verses 2 to 5. This is interesting. This is why you've got to be keen when you study prophecy. Clearly, those the verses we just read were about the coming of John the Baptist. These verses 2 to 5 project to the end 
the second coming. This, if you're familiar with Handel's Messiah, one of my favorite musical pieces uh, ever, ever written, uh, there is a great, uh, one of the great choruses in there, who shall abide the day of his coming? And who will stand when he appears? He will be like a refiner's fire. It's powerful, powerful. And that's what this is taken from here. But who can endure the day of his coming? This is the second coming now. Who can stand when he appears? For he's like a refiner's fire, like a fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi, sons of Levi, the priesthood. And refine them like gold and silver. And they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord. This is part of the, part of the indictment. So that they're half-hearted in their worship. As in the days of old. As in the former years. And I will draw near to you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers. Against the adulterers. Against those who swear falsely. Against those who oppress the hired worker in his wages. The widow, the fatherless. Against those who thrust aside the sojourner. And do not fear me, says the Lord. You see mixed in there some of the Ten Commandments. Clearly, they're, they're highlighted. God says, I will judge such. And the sad thing is that it was happening in the midst of the people of God in Malachi's day. In the Malachi 4, 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah, a prophet. All of, these, all of these, this language is the, is the focus of preparing the way for the first coming of Jesus and for the second coming of Jesus. And then we know, of course, if you're familiar with the New Testament, uh, there's this mixture here where John the Baptist is a, is a type of Elijah, is an Elijah. Let's just look at this real quickly. Look at Matthew 3, 3. Track with me here. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Reference to John the Baptist. Matthew 11, 10 and following. This is he of whom it was written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. In terms of if, if, what he's saying there is that the prophetic utterance moves to its crescendo effect when John comes on the scene. He is, he is the bridge prophet. He is the last prophet uh, talking about the coming of Messiah. He is the one who introduces Messiah. So he is in the Messianic age. And he is the greatest of those who called for the people to be ready for the coming of the Messiah. No one greater than John the Baptist. Yet, because it's a new kingdom, watch this. The one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. In other words, those who will come to embrace the Messiah are greater than the greatest prophet of Israel. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence. And the violent take it by force. There... We're not going to get off the topic here, but I mean, there's a, there's a prime example that this notion of just let go and let God have his wonderful way in your life is not found in the scriptures. If you want to take heaven, you take heaven by storm. You earnestly seek the Lord. The violent take it by force. It's a powerful image Jesus gives. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. So Jesus identifies him there. Matthew 17, 9, 9 to 13. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded, Tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. The disciples asked him, Then why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? He answered, Elijah does come, and he'll restore all things. So now he's talking about the end time, second coming. Watch what he does. But I tell you that Elijah has already come. And they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they pleased. Of course, he was beheaded. So also the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands. Then his disciples understood that he was speaking to them of John the Baptist. <clears throat> Mark 1, 3, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Again, Mark 9, 10, and 11. So they kept the matter themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. 
and they ask him, why do the scribes say that Elijah first must come? Luke 1, 17, he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready the Lord's, for the Lord a people prepared for him. Luke 3, 4, as it's written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying <clears throat> in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And then John 1, 23, he said, who are you then? Are you the Christ? No, I'm not. Who are you? He said, I'm the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. So you have this John the Baptist as the archetype of Elijah. And then you have the second coming where Elijah will will come. Remember, Elijah was not, he did not die. He was translated. He was taken up into heaven. And he will come back to usher in the consummation of the age uh, as, the, as the one. Moses and Elijah, when you read Moses and Elijah in the scriptures, you're talking about the figures who summarize, who typify the law and the prophets, okay? What about a contribution? What kind of contribution does, does Malachi make to the whole uh, witness of scripture? Well, it's unique in that you have, you have God functioning almost as a trial lawyer toward his people. You're robbing me. The people say, how? In this way. So back and forth. The people rationalize, God, God shows them it's false. Your rationalizations are false. You're guilty as I have spoken. And it kind of gives you a, a window into the final judgment. There's no doubt in my mind, people will come up with all kinds of rationalizations. You see, folks, while on this earth, Jesus will either be our advocate at the judgment or he will be our accuser. He is not neutral toward any son of Adam, any daughter of Eve. John, in his letter, promises that we will have an advocate. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he comes and testifies on our behalf. He pleads, as the Puritans just say, he pleads his wounds, his five wounds. Look at my hands, look at my feet, look at the spear hole in my side. And he pleads those wounds as the basis of God forgiving sinners who come by faith to him. But he also accuses, and this is one of the roles you see here in the book of of Malachi. He will be the accuser. He will strip away every pretentious excuse. I don't think Christians in the West take this very seriously. Somehow they think they've dodged a bullet. Christians, professing Christians in the West. And I mentioned earlier, and I was off by two, 55 verses in Malachi, 47 are spoken by God. This is the highest proportion of all the prophets. It sets Malachi uh, aside on its own it is unique in the preponderance of god speaking remember we've we've studied prophecies where where basically the prophet's talking about himself and about but not not a lot of thundering from god 47 of 55 verses god is speaking joel and zephaniah present the theme of the day of the lord uh, with greater intensity than malachi They end their prophecy on a note of hope and blessing. Malachi is a fitting conclusion to the Old Testament because God invokes the law and the prophets. If you you may not remember when we studied through the law early on, I told you that there's a term that Jewish scholars use of the Old Testament called the Tanakh. And the Tanakh is the from the Torah and from Nach from Navim, the prophets. And then one more term that Kate takes in what they call the writings. The writings will be the historical books, the, the poetic books. And the, and the Tanakh is the, is the corpus of the Old Testament, the whole uh, content of, of what you and I call the Old Testament. But anytime the Old Testament is being summarized, it's law and prophets, law and prophets, law and prophets. And so Elijah, pardon me, Malachi is closed out with an appeal to remember the law and recognize the prophets. 
I'm sending Elijah. Malachi underscores the sinful human condition and anticipates that God's solution to that is the coming of Messiah who will cleanse by grace through faith or purify by judgment and wrath. Nobody, as one fellow said, nobody gets out alive. Nobody escapes the hand of God. So, since the day is coming that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, the question is, as not just for us, but for anybody, are you going to bow now or are you going to bow later? Because you will bow. All will bow at the coming of Messiah. And that's Malachi. That's, any questions or comments you have about that?